Okay, so having looked at the domain of uh, several functions of several variables, we now want to move on and look at the range of such functions. Now, in single variable functions, where you had the function um, f of just x, we saw to see that in such functions, when it is possible to actually get the inverse of a function, we saw that you can just get the inverse of the function, get the domain of the inverse, and the domain of the inverse would end up being the range of the original function f of x. But we're saying that such tricks cannot be applied when it comes to several, several uh, functions of several variables. Um, maybe they can, but it will just be a little bit messy. So instead, since we can't use that trick, then the trick or the method that we're going to use in this case to predict what the range is would be to try to actually plot the function and see what you're getting from there. If you can plot it, then can you actually observe what you have, what type of values or solutions you get from your, from your function? So that, of course, it's such solutions which will help you make a prediction. So we're going to use two types of um, uh, methods here. They're the ones that I use mostly. Try to observe the function and see if you can make prediction. And then apart from that, when you can plot the function, can you sketch the function so that you use the graph of the function to actually predict what the range is going to be. Let's use uh, expressions that we have worked out already. And we're going to pick the examples whose domain we actually evaluated. The first one is this one here. In this function, what we have is x comma y, a uh, function f of x comma y equals to root x squared minus y squared. So this is going to be our first example. Well, before we even work out the examples, let me just show you some of the most common expressions that you find. The first one, as you might assume, as you might guess, is functions which have a square root. Whether you're dealing with single variable or multivariable functions, if I gave you the square root of x here, you have to see that regardless of the value of x I pick, firstly, x must not be a negative because of course we know that we have a square root there. So your domain will clearly not have or not include negative values of x. So all the values of x are going to be above zero or equal, um, equal or greater than zero. But other than that, you have to see that here, since I only have a positive outside here, regardless of the value of x I am to select here, this square root will never give me a negative solution. For all values of x in my domain, the possible solutions I'll ever get from here will always be positive. What does that mean? In this case, just by observation, I can tell that clearly the smallest value I can ever have as my solution is zero. Other than zero, everything else will give me something greater than zero. And since I only have x, the higher the values of x I pick, the greater my solution. So this will keep on going until I reach positive infinity. That will be my domain in this, my, my range, I mean, in this case. Notice that I just used observation. Well, it turns out we can extend the same concept to functions of several variables. Assume we had x comma y now coming this side, and this is actually equal to the square root of, let's say we have x squared, then we have, let's say, plus, let me say plus or minus y squared. Firstly, uh, is this our example there? Is this our first example? Yes, it is our first example. So as you can see here, we are saying that the first part in determining the domain, we did see that this expression must always be greater than or equal to zero. So that part is already established under the domain. So for any value of x and y that you pick from the domain, uh, what do you expect to get? Well, we expect that when we evaluate the square root here, it will always give us a positive solution. We do not expect to get a negative solution. What does that imply? It then implies that the smallest possible solution we can ever get from here is going to be a zero. And when do we expect that? We expect to get that when x is actually equals to y, or when the modulus of x is equal to uh, the modulus of y. When they are equal, then we're going to have a zero there. 
So this is going to be the smallest possible solution. Other than that, all the other solutions we're going to get are going to be greater than zero and we keep on going up until when we reach infinity. So the range in this case is going to start from zero, going all the way up to infinity. Okay, based on that, do we have any questions? Is this part okay? Okay, let's look at a second example to just help you cement what we're looking at there. Okay, look at this one here. So in this second example, we have f of x comma y. And here we're saying that this is equals to root y minus x squared. Okay. So what are we seeing there? So if we focus on this expression, clearly, when it, if we're trying to get the domain, we see to say that for our domain, we must have x minus, as in y minus x squared. This must always be greater than or equals to zero. So our domain will be a set of values x comma y, members of uh, the root numbers squared, um, such that y must be greater than or equal to x squared. So this is what we must have. Uh, now, if we selected values of x and y coming from this domain, uh, what do we expect to be our range? Well, what we see here is that for any selection we make, the square root can never bring out a negative. Why? Because it is positive. You can try pick any, so any values of x and y and make sure first that they satisfy that condition. Once you have done that, now try to plug them in this expression. What you will see is that regardless of what you pick, what pair you select for x and y, the square root of that will always be greater than zero, or should I say it will always be positive. So all in all, the square root cannot magically drop a negative. It cannot magically bring a negative. So because of that, we end up saying that, okay, in this case, whatever will come out from this square root will always be greater than zero or it will always be positive. The only question then is how far up in the positive direction do we go? Uh, the starting point clearly here, the starting point would be zero because th this can be equals to zero. So in the range, the smallest possible solution will have zero because below zero, we go to negatives. So just the nearest the negatives, which is zero and zero is fine. But the challenge is, do we have a maximum limit? In this case, we do not have a maximum limit. So we'll keep on going up until when we reach infinity. Um, the other examples we're going to look at, not this one, not the one coming next, but after that, they are going to have a maximum limit for our, uh, for our range. So you'll see exactly how we treat them. But in this case, our range is going to run from uh, zero to positive infinity. Now, this was also a little bit straightforward, but let me show you something that might not necessarily be straightforward. Maybe that is going to uh, help you really pick, put everything to perspective, but it might throw you off completely because it's not a pushover. I'll let you try this one. It's similar to this one, uh, but it's not just x minus y squared. The one we're going to do here is going to be this one. Okay, consider this one. Well, clearly, uh, we did look at this one in terms of the domain. For the domain, we sort to say that y must be greater than, is it greater? Yeah, greater than or equal to x squared. And apart from that, we also saw that one minus, um, yeah, this one now, did we look at this one? Okay. When I copied this one, I didn't have a square down there, or maybe it did. 
Okay, yeah, when I got it at first, I didn't include that square there, but it's it's fine. We worked it out with just one minus x. So um, the correct one, of course, has one minus x squared. So the one that we worked out when determining the domain um, was just one minus x. So yeah, and that's what we got. That's okay for that one. But the one we're going to work out now, I'm going to use the one with the square there. So first, let's get its domain y is greater than or equals to x squared, that's fine. But looking at the denominator, for the denominator now we have one minus x squared must not be equal to one, to zero I mean, implying that minus x squared must not be equals to negative one or x squared must not be equals to one. What does this imply? It implies that x must not be equal to when I square root. Now I am initiating the square root myself. When I am initiating it, I will include the plus or minus to say this is going to be plus or minus the square root of one, which is just going to be one. What does this mean? It means that x cannot be equal to positive one and x cannot be equal to negative one. This makes sense. What I have there is what? One minus x squared. I don't want this to be equals to zero. And clearly, there are two values which can give me zero. When x is negative one, I'll have negative one squared. When you square and simplify, this will give you zero. When x is positive one, this will be one squared. And clearly, this will also give you zero. This is why you have plus or minus one, which excludes both x is equals to one and x is equals to minus one. Based on that, our domain for that function is going to include this. Firstly, y must be greater or equal to x squared. And then secondly, x must not be equals to plus or minus one. And lastly, x comma y must be members of real numbers squared. So this is going to be the domain. Now, if you select x and y from that domain, what is going to be the range? Well, for this one, it's going to be a little bit tricky. If you're going to sketch it, then how are you sketching it? That is going to be your problem. Now, generally, uh, one way that you can use to actually uh, play around with this is to observe what each part is bringing. Okay, let me copy this. So observe what each part is doing and see if you can combine them to predict the results. All you want to see is, can you have negative solutions or can you have, um, or are you only going to have positive solutions? When I look at the top part, the top part is something we analyzed in the previous example. The square root of an atom can never give you a negative solution. So the top part will always bring positive solutions. So we see positive solutions are possible in this case. But look at that denominator. In the denominator, all we're saying is that x cannot be one. But apart from that, apart from just x being one or negative one, x can be anything else. Meaning that it's possible for x to be something like a 10. And when you subtract a 10 from one or 10 squared, you're going to get a hundred. So it's one minus a hundred, which will give you negative. So in other words, from the denominator, it's possible you can get a negative solution. In fact, when you look at the denominator, to a large extent, you will get negative solutions. But if it were only negative solutions coming from the denominator, then in this case, your expression will only be positive times negative, or positive divided by negative, which will make your range only the set of negative numbers. But when you look closely at the denominator, at the denominator, we see to say the denominator is only saying that x cannot be one or negative one, but x can still take values between negative one and one. And notice that for values of x between one and negative one, the denominator will actually give you positive, implying that when the denominator, the numerator is positive and the denominator is negative, the range will be negative. But when the numerator is positive and the denominator is also positive, notice that the range is going to be positive. But since both denominators are possible, 
the range is going to be a combination of both positive and negative numbers, which concludes that the range is going to be everything, the set of real numbers. But since we do have a square in the mix, this is going to be the set of real numbers squared. So we're going to say x and y, or x comma y, are members of real numbers squared.